Welcome back to Critical Accounting. My name is Cameron Graham, Professor of Accounting at the Schulich School of Business. I want to go over some of the technicalities around revenue recognition in this video. Revenue recognition is a quintessential accrual accounting topic. Yeah, it's a bit of an advanced topic, but I'd like to put it into an introductory lecture because I think it's important to undermine the notion that sales are simple. There's actually a lot of future events that could take place, returns, warranty claims, that you have to account for when you sell something. So let's see what we can learn. I want to go over three different things, how to handle discounts for early payment, how to handle returns using allowances, and how to handle two different kinds of warranties. So first up, discounts for early payment. The simplest way to account for discounts for early payment is the direct method. And a lot of companies use this. So consider a scenario where something is sold on 2, 10, and 30 terms. So 2% discount if the customer pays within 10 days. Otherwise, the total amount of the invoice, the net amount of the invoice is due within 30 days. So uh, you would simply record the uh, sale in the normal fashion, debit to accounts receivable, credit to revenue. And then all you have to do is look at what happens if a collection is done within 10 days. So if the collection does happen within 10 days, you get to debit to cash for the $980 because the customer took the discount and you clear out the accounts receivable of $1,000 and that leaves you $20 left over. And what's done is that is debited to a sales discounts account. And that's a contra revenue account. So when you see the top line on the income statement and it says sales net or revenue net, what it's doing is taking the gross revenue and subtracting any discounts or returns or anything else that affected the sale, giving you a net figure. So in this case, the revenue account would hold a thousand dollars. The sales discount account would hold 20 and on the income statement, those would be combined together into a net sales line that says $980, which matches the cash that was received. Now, the problem, of course, is what happens if the sale is near the end of the month, because then you're going to have the possibility of a sale occurring within one month and the discount coming in the next month. So your income statement for the first month would show the $1,000 and the income statement for the next month would already start off in the hole by $20. The revenue would be understated that month. And it would have been overstated in the first month because you didn't really earn the $1,000. So what's the solution? What you want to do is estimate the discount that the customers will take and adjust for this at the year end or the month end, if you're doing monthly statements by setting up an allowance. So let's see how to do that. So this is the allowance method for handling discounts for early payment. Basic scenario here is that we've got a situation where in the last 10 days of the year, a company sold $2 million worth of goods and the goods are sold on the 2, 10, and 30 terms that we've used before. So 2% discount for early payment within 10 days. Otherwise, the balance is due in 30 days. And here's the crucial thing. The company needs to understand what its experience is with these customers. So looking back at previous data, uh, we're going to assume that this company has discovered that 60% of its customers pay within 10 days in order to take advantage of that discount. The other piece that you need to think about is that the allowance account that we're going to be adjusting might have a, a balance left over in it from the previous year. So in this situation, the allowance account we're going to assume has $10,000 debit balance sitting in that. So let's think about what that is. We're going to be setting up an allowance as a contra to our accounts receivable. So the accounts receivable has a debit balance normally. So the contra account would have a credit balance normally. So here's a situation where leftover from last year is not a credit balance, but a debit balance. All that means is that when the company estimated its allowance last year, they underestimated and they actually ended up with customers taking more of a discount than was anticipated. So we're going to have to take that into account when we're setting up the allowance in this situation. As before, we've got a little black square here for you to fill in. If you've got a pencil and a piece of paper, you can work it out there. I want to see you make an adjustment at the year end for the expected sales discount. So this is the, the last 10 days of the year. We've had $2 million worth of sales. We need to know now what to show on the balance sheet and on the income statement for our accounts receivable value and for our revenue for the year. 
So what kind of an adjustment would you make to take into account the fact that some of the sales that you build in the last 10 days, you might not actually collect the full amount. And then once you've done that, I want you to show me how you would record a thousand dollar collection under two different scenarios, customers that pay that thousand dollars within the 10 day period and customers that don't make it under the wire and they pay after the 10 days. So take a moment to work that out and we'll look at the solution that I'm proposing. And here it is. So the first thing is that the company has the $2 million worth of sales and needs to calculate what it wants the discount or the allowance to be in the allowance account that's going to be set up as a contrary to the accounts receivable. We've got $2 million worth of sales at a 2% discount would give us $40,000, but we're only expecting 60% of that to be claimed. So we want our allowance to be $24,000 in order to handle the discount that we're anticipating customers will take. And the problem is, of course, that there's a $10,000 debit balance in that account, and we want it to read $24,000. So what we need to do is not put in $24,000. We actually need to put in $34,000. So what we're focused on here is this account right here, the allowance for sales discounts, which is a contra AR account. Under IFRS, there's a bit of a bias towards making sure that we put a focus on getting the balance sheet accounts as accurate as we can with all our best efforts to estimate things correctly there on the assumption that any discrepancies that arise as a result of this that throw things out a little bit will happen on the income statement. And the numbers on the income statement are often very large compared to the balance sheet numbers when you're looking at the accounts receivable, for instance, that's actually a small amount compared to the overall revenue for the year. So the result here is we're going to have a very accurate $24,000 estimate for the allowance for sales discounts, which is $34,000 less than $10,000 that was in there would give us 24. And the sales discounts account itself, which is contra revenue, would be $34,000. And that will be lost in the noise of the millions and millions of dollars that were sold this year. Remember, this is a company that sold $2 million just in the last 10 days. So that $34,000 contra revenue account is quite small in comparison. So having set up this discount, the allowance for the anticipated discounts as a contra to AR, what happens when customers actually do make a payment? So the first scenario is that we collect the thousand dollars within the 10 day period. So we only get $980 because that's all the customer sent us. They took the $20 discount. That takes care of their obligation to us of a thousand dollars. So we're going to credit accounts receivable for a thousand. And what do we do with that $20 that is left over that we need to balance things out? We're going to use up some of the allowance for sales discounts, which had a credit balance of $24,000. We can use up a little bit of it for this customer, the $1,000 that we're collecting out of all the $2 million that we're trying to collect, just a small piece of it. So we're just using up 20 bucks of it. Now. What about the customers that didn't pay within the 10 day period? The 40% of them that we anticipated, they are going to be handled like this straightforward debit to cash for the thousand dollars. Cause they have to pay the full amount credit to accounts receivable. What we're hoping is that in the grand scheme of things, approximately 60% of the customers will claim that discount and use up the $24,000. The rest will pay full price. And we're going to have a little bit left over, either slight debit or slight credit balance. That's just going to sit there until the end of this new fiscal year. And we'll repeat the process all over again. Last time around, we had $10,000 debit balance left over. Next time it might be $2,000 credit balance. If we didn't use up the entire allowance that we created, time will tell. All right. So let's look at returns. Just as with sales discounts, there is a direct method for handling returns. So pretty straightforward. You have a sale on account. So debit to accounts receivable, credit revenue of a thousand dollars. We'll assume that the cost of goods sold was 600. So we're taking it out of inventory with credit to inventory, debit to cost of goods sold. So the income statement is going to show revenue of a thousand dollars, cost of goods sold of 600 and a gross margin of 400 bucks. If a return happens, then it's very straightforward. You simply undo everything. Those accounts are shown there. The only difference is that rather than put a debit against your revenue account, you have a contra revenue account for the returns. 
And that's the only difference here. You're just trying to keep track of the net sales by keeping track of two separate accounts, one for the gross revenue and the contra revenue account for the returns. By doing it this way with those two separate accounts, it allows you to understand at the end of the year, just what kind of a problem you've got with returns, how big that is compared to your uh, overall revenue. Now, problem of course, is that to what happens if the sale is near the end of the year, the sale might be in one year. And what if the customer doesn't return it until the next, you've got a problem because your revenue in the one year is going to be overstated and your revenue in the next year is going to be understated. And of course your inventory is all out of whack as well. What do you do? You estimate the likely returns, just as previously we estimated the discounts, we set up an allowance for it. And then we use the allowance as needed. And here's the difference between the returns and the discounts. We're actually going to recover the unused allowance because we're trying to keep track of this on a sale by sale basis. So here's the scenario that I want you to think about. Again, blank square there conceptually for you to fill it in. If you want to get out a pencil and a piece of paper to try and work this out, that would be great. The scenario is this, we have had a wholesale of 200 desk chairs. So a business to business sale of desk chairs, the price of the chairs was $120 each. They were our cost of $90 and we're anticipating that 3% of the units that we sell will be returned on average by our customers. So in this case, that would be six units that we anticipate being returned. And the return policy is that customers get a full refund if they return the unsold goods within three months. But after three months, the chairs are theirs. We're not taking them back. How would you record this sale? You have to set up allowances for all of the stuff that's going to happen. So give it some thought, pause the video and try and work out your best shot. All right. Assuming that you have taken the time to do that, here's how I would do it. The concept here is that the customer has bought the chairs with a right to return any unsold chairs within three months. What's interesting here, and this is a piece that the textbook leaves out is that the seller, that'd be us in this case, has a matching right of recovery, right? Cause those chairs are going to be returned. We have the right to recover them and the customer has the right to return them. So if we do our calculations on the estimated value of the returns, the selling price return would be estimated at six times $120 or 720 and at cost six times $90 or 540. So what do we do with these figures to record the sale? Here we go. It's a little bit complicated because we want to keep track of everything. So we have the gross amount of the transaction of $24,000. So that's the debit to accounts receivable that we expect the customer to pay if they don't return anything. We're going to record the revenue though, as partly the part that we're going to recognize and the liability, the refund liability for the amount that we expect to be returned is effectively conceptually like unearned revenue. So we're just postponing the recognition of that revenue till we see what happens. We're anticipating that we're not going to be able to keep it because of the refund that we're expecting to give. So rather than call it unearned revenue, we're going to call it a refund liability. But again, it's a liability that will show up on the balance sheet. It's not going to show up on the income statement. So matching that we have a credit to inventory of $18,000 for the cost of all those chairs, the 200 desk chairs at $90, but we're going to record the cost of goods sold only for the amount that we expect to stay out there. And the rest of the debit is not going to go to cost of goods sold. It's going to go onto the balance sheet as a right of recovery asset. So we've basically set up a liability for the refunds we might have to give and a right of recovery asset for the chairs that we expect to get back. Let's assume that the customer returns two chairs within the return period. We'd anticipated that they would return six, they only return two. So how would you record the return? Again, quick pause here. If you like to get out your pencil and paper and try to work out how you would do this. I'm going to assume that you're going to pause right here. And here is the way that I would record this. So the effect on the net sales is two times the selling price or $204. The effect on the cost of sales is two times the $90 wholesale cost or $180. So what do we do with that? We need to use up the allowances that we set up in the previous slide. And here's what would happen when the return occurs, when the customer brings those chairs back, we're going to debit the refund liability for $240 and credit accounts receivable for 240. So the gross amount 
we had set up in accounts receivable for the 200 shares at $24,000. We're going to reduce that accounts receivable now by $240 because the customer doesn't owe us for these shares. And the debit is going to go against the refund liability because we no longer have an obligation to make that part of the refund. On the inventory side, we're going to put the shares back in the inventory. So it's a debit to inventory of $180. And the credit is going to wipe out a piece of the rate of recovery asset that we set up in the same amount. So two shares at $90, canceling out $180 worth of that rate of recovery asset. So you can imagine how the income statement and the balance sheet look right now. Basically, this return event doesn't affect the income statement because the refund liability accounts receivable inventory and the right of recovery asset are all on the balance sheet. So what happens when the return period expires? I want you to think about what you would do with the fact that the customer didn't return all six shares as expected. So there's some allowance left over. What are you going to do with that? Again, pause the video, try to work it out yourself, give it your best shot, and then we'll have a look at the solution that I'm proposing. So four chairs are unreturned. There's a couple of things we need to do. Basically, we need to deal with the refund liability that's left over and the right of recovery asset that's left over. So the first part is the refund liability. So we'd set up $480 that didn't get used. And it turns out that the customer kept the shares. So if that actually gets to be counted as revenue. So conceptually, I said this was like unearned revenue and now we've earned it because the customer has kept the shares. So we're basically going to cancel the refund liability, whatever's left in there, $480, and pull it into revenue on the income statement. So at the end of the return period, we're moving the amount into revenue, so onto the income statement. Same thing happens with the right of recovery asset. We're going to credit it and get rid of it, the balance that's in there, and move it over to cost of goods sold. What you got here basically is if we did a good job of estimating all of these things, this would be zero and there'd be no effect on the income statement for this year. The assumption here is that we sold all those things near the end of one year, and this might be happening somewhere into the next year. So we're going to have a slight misstatement here. We're going to have a little bit of revenue and a little bit of cost of goods sold being added to this year's income statement. But if we've done a good job of estimating, this will be a tiny amount. And of course, keep in mind that you have multiple customers and some of them might have returned a little bit less than expected, as was the case here. Others might return more than it's expected. And all of that should balance out so that the effect on the income statement in this next period, the distortion should be minimal. All right. Final thing we want to look at is warranties. There's two kinds of warranties I want to take you through. They're called assurance warranties and service warranties. The basic distinction between these is that uh, with assurance warranties, that's built into the price, the selling price. Service warranties are these added on warranties that electronics companies often try to sell you like an extra warranty on your phone or something like that. So let's look at how these are handled. Let's look at how an assurance warranty operates on the bookkeeping side of things. What we've got here is I'm just going to walk you through these transactions rather than setting them up as an exercise for you. I just want to make it really clear what's happening here. Let's assume that we've got a sale of some computer equipment for $28,000 and it's on account. So it's a debit to account simple credit to revenue for the sale. What we have to do at this point in time is estimate what the cost of the warranty is going to be because we've included that warranty in the sale price. So we need to match to the revenue event, the expense that goes along with it. So we've got a debit for the estimated warranty expense. Where did we come up with $3,900? Well, it was just based on our experience with all of this equipment. We know that there's going to be some breakage or some repairs that need to be done. And we expect it to add up to 3,900 bucks for this warranty. Presumably that's built into the sale price to make sure that we're not losing our shirt on repairs and replacements and stuff. But of course we haven't actually paid any money or given the customer any replacement parts. So the credit is not to cash. It's just to a provision for the warranty. So this becomes a liability on the balance sheet at the point that we're doing this. And of course the warranty could actually be handled in the following fiscal period. That's why we need to set up this liability on the balance sheet now. So what happens when we actually have the expenditure? Again, this could be in the following year, but if we have an expenditure of cash to pay somebody to fix the equipment, or if we give them a piece of inventory to replace the equipment, we're going to have a credit 
to our asset section of our balance sheet. The credit would be to cash. If we paid somebody to fix it, credit would be to inventory. If we used a piece of existing inventory to replace the equipment that we'd originally given to the customer. The debit is going to be to use up the warranty provision that we had set up. In this case, it's slightly less than the $3,900 we'd anticipated. What this means is that we have an expenditure of cash for a use of inventory, but we don't have an expense at that point because we already recognized the expense previously. All we do is we debit the provision for the warranty. So at the end of the warranty period, then we may have a little bit left over. And if we do, then we get to clear it out. There is in this case, $200 left over. So a debit to the provision of the warranty. Where does that go? Well, you could call it revenue, I suppose, if you wanted to, but a more accurate way to handle this and the way that I would like you to handle it is to credit a recovery of the warranty expense. So any kind of an account can have contra accounts that go with it. In this case, we've got a contra expense account. So just as the discounts that we talked about earlier were a contra revenue account, this is a contra expense account. And rather than crediting the warranty expense account itself and then reducing the apparent expense that we had, we set up the contra account so that we know what the gross amount of the expense was and what the recovery was. That gives us more information for managing all of this as we gain experience with it. So the things to keep in mind here are that the expense might exceed the allowance on any individual sale, but if you've got a whole bunch of sales, then this will all average out. You have to decide what to do at the end of the warranty period. You may wait until the end of the year rather than the end of the warranty period to clear out any leftover provision and create the credit to the recovery of warranty expense. But on average, if you've done a good job with the estimates, the allowance will approximately equal the expense and any discrepancy will be quite minimal. All right, service warranties. These are the ones where a customer pays an extra amount to get special handling of their problems down the road. By the way, uh, never buy these service contracts. They're extremely lucrative for the companies. You should be insuring yourself against catastrophic things like life insurance and disability insurance. Don't insure yourself against breakage of your cell phone. If you don't believe me, go talk to Professor Moshe Malevsky in our finance department. He's really adamant about that kind of stuff. So the uh, sale here, we've got a $33,000 accounts receivable because we've got that same $28,000 sale that we did before. But in this case, the customer has paid an extra $5,000 to have that equipment serviced on a regular basis. So the total amount that they owe us is $33,000. We don't get to recognize all of that as revenue yet, just the amount that we have recognized for the sale of the computer, because that's the one component that we have earned the contract. The other piece of the contract we will earn as time goes by. At the moment of sale, we've got a liability for the $5,000 now. Presumably the customer will pay all of this within the month and we'll collect it. The liability is ours to live up to our end of the bargain. As time goes by over the life of the contract, we record the revenue. So we would just take that $5,000 and we would divide it up by the number of months that the contract lasts. And by the end of the day, the total amount would have been recognized on a gradual basis. I'm just showing you what the total amount is at the end. We would have debited that liability and used it all up and we would have recognized all of the revenue, the servicing revenue, $5,000. Again, this is just done on a monthly basis over the life of the contract. The service expenses are recorded as we actually have the expenditures. So in this case, the service expense turned out to be $3,700. So we would have just recorded that as we went along and uh, any given month, we might've had a small service expense or a large service expense, and it would have been matched by a little bit of the revenue for the servicing. By the time all is said and done, if we've done a good job of estimating the value of these service contracts and the costs that go along with it. We will have turned a profit. We'll have a credit to revenue of $5,000 overall and a debit to the expense of $3,700, earning us a little profit there of 1,300 bucks. What do we end up with then? Basically the conclusion that these service warranties are quite profitable. So here's an advanced topic I'm gonna to leave with you. What happens when you've got all of this combined together? You can work through this example. I'm not gonna show the solution on this slide, so you can just pause this and work away to your heart's content. I'm gonna flip over to the next slide and just show it to you. I won't discuss it because it's all basically laid out for you here. And the solution is just a combination of all those things that we talked about. The crucial piece in this that you need to think about is 
when you've got a contract price that covers a couple of different things, in this case, the equipment and the service contract, what do you do to allocate that $28,000 price between these things? And what you need is some sort of an external measure of what the value of these things are. So one possibility is that you sell these things separately and you would know what the separate price is for these things and be able to prorate the $28,000 based on the standalone price. That's the way that the textbook talks about this. Another possibility would be if you don't have these listed as separate items, trying to establish what the value of a piece of this would be on the market. So in this case, we're going to assume that someone could buy these services from someone else for $2,250. We're going to put them in our contract price. So let's allocate a portion of that contract price to that amount for the service of $2,250. So that's the way it's set up. I want you to record the sale, record the performance of any given hour of service, and record the actual warranty costs that are experienced of $3,700 and handle the end of the warranty period. So there's three pieces here. There's the event that we had before with the assurance warranty built into the sale of the equipment. But then in addition, a contract for 25 hours of service valued at $2,250. And here's what all the pieces look like. You can read them. If you didn't get all the stuff, it'll be read them and weep. Uh, but I presume that you did a fairly good job based on just working through things patiently and trying to figure it out. This is what it looks like for the sale, for the gradual performance of each hour of service, and the warranty expenditure for the assurance warranty and then what happens at the end of the warranty period. All right. So if you've got any questions, you can email me or talk to me in class. So let's sum up what we've covered. We've had a good look at sales discounts. We looked at the direct method, but the important thing to focus on there, I think, is the allowance method for sales discounts. We've looked at setting up returns allowance and the piece that the textbook leaves out, this uh, little right of recovery asset that helps keep track of the inventory and make sure that your cost of goods sold is correct. And we looked at two different kinds of warranties, assurance warranties and service warranties. So I hope this uh, helps you understand a little bit more about revenue recognition, fairly technical stuff, but I think going through this stuff helps push you to really understand the basic concept there that is built into IFRS 15. It's all about money, money, money. Ooh, money, money, money. Ooh, yeah. Dollar signs in your eyes.